Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed we do. Lots of big stories this week. So Sagar and I will break down how SCOTUS is going to play a key role in 2024 after Colorado, of course, attempting to kick Trump off of the ballot. So we'll get into all of that. And we have some polling about how people's initial, how people are initially reacting to that move by Colorado. We also have some dramatic developments in the Middle East, um, you know, things escalating between the U.S. and the Houthis out of Yemen. Uh, so we'll tell you what's going on there. We also had to pull some of the most insane comments that are coming out of Israel. There were so many of them. It was hard to choose. It was tough. And we felt we needed to devote an entire segment just to showcasing a few of them for you. So we'll bring you that as well. Also, the Democratic Party, once again, trying to cancel democracy in order to, quote unquote, save democracy. We'll give you the latest developments there. Sagar's taking a look at the Ivy Leagues. We've got a little bit of like attempted holiday yes. cheer for you here at the end. We've done some year end superlatives and that we will all be good. reveal. All positive. Yeah, yeah. We, the minute that you go negative on these this year, it will get immediately it's very dark. dark. So we're trying to look at silver linings. We're looking at the best moments of the year, what we're looking forward to, those sorts of things, That's all to kick things off. Before we do that, this is the last chance, last big show of the year. So if you can, if you're able to take advantage, we've got the Breaking Points discount right now for the yearly membership. And we already have the Colorado stuff going on. So we promised you a crazy election and it's certainly going to be crazy. So if you can help us out for the entire election year, you can go ahead and take advantage of that, breakingpoints.com. As I said, we've got some uh, other Christmas merch, all those other things that are available on our website. And we appreciate and love you all so much. One last thing, Crystal, can I yes. just say, is that we discovered, as we had pointed out before, the number one way that our show grew by basically double this year on podcast was you guys sharing it. So if you can't afford it or any of that, if you could just do us a favor and text the show to a friend of yours, send an episode or any of that uh, that you think would be helpful to them. It really does help us out or talk us up at the dinner table. That's one, mm -hmm. one thing you could do for us, maybe uh, this holiday season. But let's go ahead and start with uh, SCOTUS as we were talking about. There has been a lot of stuff going on in the last two days. Colorado's Supreme Court ruling 4-3 to block Trump of availability on the Republican ballot. This setting up a major Supreme Court challenge. The basis of this being alleging that he has committed, quote, an insurrection and has violated the clause of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. So what does all of that mean? And does President Biden agree? He weighed in yesterday on the tarmac at Air Force One. Here's what he had to say. Trump an insurrectionist, sir? Well, I think it's certainly so, so self-evident. You saw it all. Now, whether the 14th Amendment applies, I'll let the court make that decision. But he certainly supported an insurrection. And no question about it. None. Zero. And, uh, he seems to be doubling down on about everything. Anyway. President Biden saying there's no question he committed an insurrection, I guess also at the same time leaving it up to the court. This has also thrown things into the GOP uh, primary. Vivek Ramaswamy, I, I, honestly a genius move in my opinion, being like, you know what, I will drop out, Crystal. If uh, I will drop out and pull myself off the ballot if they are allowed to block Trump. Now setting and throwing the gauntlet to Nikki Haley and to Ron DeSantis. DeSantis was uh, asked about this on Newsmax. Here's what he had to say. And real quick, fellow GOP 2024 presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy saying he will remove himself from the Colorado ballot unless Trump's eligibility is restored. Would you do the same? No, I think that's just playing into the left. Um, I think the case will get overturned by the Supreme Court, but I've qualified for all the ballots. I'm competing in all the states and I'm going to accumulate the delegates necessary. That's the whole name of the game in this situation. So it would just be playing to the left, Crystal. Uh, this just does demonstrate all the difficulty of running against Trump. And I thought that those two clips actually show some of the political conundrums and dynamics that we have right now. We got the president and most of the Democrats, they agree, like I guess at a rhetorical level, a quote unquote insurrection was committed. This all actually started, you were the first person who ever showed it to me actually, of those Atlantic articles of yeah. those law professors who were laying out this legal theory. Only took a matter of three months to go all the way to the Supreme Court. And now we're going to have it, you know, effectively has to be challenged sometime just in the next two weeks before January 4th. That's the deadline before Colorado is allowed to implement this. And presumably the high court is going to take up this challenge. But politically, this has set up some crazy dynamics. But legally, too, uh, what we've discovered is that the court's ruling on this will set the rule for all 50 states. This is not an election decision, because if they rule uh, on the 
side of the Colorado Supreme <laughs> Court, they would decide that for the entire country, Donald Trump is not allowed to remain on the ballot. It's probably the most significant electoral case, I think, since Bush versus Gore. And that's just the first of many cases that will be appearing before the court this year. No doubt yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, so this is not a state election law issue. That's why it would be relevant for the entire country. This has to do directly with this provision in the Constitution, which was originally put in place you know, following the Civil War. Um, it was used most often during Reconstruction to bar people who had you know, been traitorous against our own country from ever holding office again. And you know, just to, to give people the text of what that says, this is Section 3 of the Civil War era 14th Amendment. It says, quote, no person shall hold any office, civil or military, under the U.S., who have previous, having previously taken an oath as an officer of the United States to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. So anybody who held, has to be barred you know, from holding office if they engage in an insurrection. Left unsaid here is how you determine yes. if someone engaged in an Thank insurrection. You. And that has never been decided. And so in that way, I actually think it's very appropriate that this go to the Supreme Court for, you know, the not that I have a lot of confidence in this court at this point. I think it's a very partisan entity. Um, three of the nine justices actually put on the court, of course, by Donald Trump. But I do think that is the appropriate place for them to adjudicate how should this provision in the Constitution actually be applied. And, you know, there's a lot of hot takes out there. Perhaps my take is the hottest of all, which is I actually think it's a very tricky legal question. Hmm. I don't think that it is clear cut in either direction. Now, a lot of the analysis that I've seen, effectively, people who are opposed to this decision, it effectively seems like they just don't think that this should be in the Constitution at all, um, that they think it should be left to the voters. I, I think that's a perfectly legitimate point of view. Mm -hmm. It's not one that I happen to agree with. I think it's appropriate for a state to have the means to bar people who have engaged in traitorous or uh, rebellions or insurrections against the state to prohibit them from holding office. So I do think it's appropriate that something like this be in the Constitution. But then the question, this type of legal questions this raises is, you know, primarily, as I said, who are the office holders? That was actually what the lower Colorado court got hung up on as they said, well, technically, we don't think that the presidency qualifies as an office under this particular provision. That was the piece that the Colorado Supreme Court said, no, we think by the plain reading dictionary definition, the president of the United States would qualify. Um, and then the key question is, OK, well, what's your definition of an insurrection? And what's your definition of whether someone engaged in it? And who is it up to to determine? Does it have to be determined by an act of Congress? That's one possibility. That's what some other courts have ruled because there have been something like 18 cases so far on the same challenge in different states. Yep. All of them have been rejected except for this one. Um, the other question then becomes, OK, well, does a state court have the ability in the jurisdiction to be able to rule on this question? So there are all kinds of very difficult and frankly, unprecedented legal terrain here to navigate. And so, like I said, I actually I actually think it is entirely appropriate that this go to the Supreme Court for them to say, listen, this is the meaning of the text. This is how it's determined. This is the standard going forward. And also, let's be clear, it is almost unimaginable that this court is going to side with Colorado. Yeah, there, I, I very much doubt it. <laughs> I actually, I don't think, there's a chance it could go 9-0. I, I really do believe that. Although maybe 7-2 or something like that from my court watchers. So I would split the difference. I don't think that people are saying that the clause itself is appropriate. It's just that the bar needs to be a lot higher. So for example, if we think about the Civil War, taking up arms and fighting for the Confederate states and literally fighting <laughs> against your own country, one of the reasons why they have that provision in there was specifically about people who were officers of the United States military, or take Jefferson Davis. He was literally a sitting senator for the state of Mississippi. I mean, he genu genuinely committed treason. Right. And yet, this is where I think treason, the word itself, <laughs> the eventual punishment for it, our public understanding of it, let's think about it. I believe the Rosenbergs were the last people who were put to death for committing treason. Uh, Bob Hansen, the FBI spy from 2000 and July 2001, I believe he also you know, could have qualified for the death penalty because he was actively caught spying for Russia, but he eventually pleaded guilty and all that. Those are about as far as I go for what treason and that should look like. And I think the but same treason, 
should treason remain isn't with, in this uh, provision. No, no, no. It doesn't I'm saying say treason. in terms of how we publicly understand it, yeah. as in, for example, uh, Hillary Clinton going on television and accusing Tulsi Gabbard of committing treason. She called her a Russian spy. That's outrageous to me because to me, the word treason, the idea, the public understanding, the legal definition, it has to remain incredibly, incredibly high and used only in the rarest of circumstances when it truly qualifies. I think insurrection too is one there where we had a political, a civic, and a legal understanding of that time of what it means to take up rebellion against the cause of the United States and the United States government. That is not in, even close to arriving at that bar for there, where I think we are right now, where I do think this comes into anti-democratic territory. Now, that being said, I agree. I'm glad that it's going to the Supreme Court, and I hope they set the bar as high as I just said, where unless you literally declare a civil war against the United States, actively use your office as a, you know, a government holder at the federal level, and you violate your oath and you work against those interests, you aid and abet genuine enemies, foreign governments or others. That's one separate thing. But mm -hmm. a political understanding here where we've already had the political means to deal with this, and that was called impeachment, and Trump didn't get impeached. I mean, this is something which I talked about uh, previously. People can go roll it if they want. I think it was like January 7th, maybe January 8th. I did an entire monologue about this, about why I eventually thought that the de resolving this through small d democratic means to me remains the best possible avenue. I don't disagree that it's very, uh, legally we should have something like this on the books, mm -hmm. especially if we consider what the country and the environment and all of that were at the time. But there's also a reason it basically wasn't used for over 100 years. And and I don't think we're even close to anything like that, nor See, should we be. I So the definition of insurrection in the Merriam-Webster dictionary is an act or instance of revolting against civil authority or an established government. I think January 6th meets that definition. But then I so mean, does very, uh, BLM. Very I mean, does it? Because very clearly what they were there to do and they were all saying 1776 mm. and they certainly saw themselves as revolutionaries engaged in an act to try to, now it, it was Keystone Cops, right? The fact that they had very little chance of succeeding doesn't really matter though. The intent was to block the workings of our government and the peaceful transfer of power. So I don't think it's crazy to label this an insurrection. But again, I, I think it's tricky, right? The other question, there are First Amendment issues here too, in terms of whether Trump's speech that he gave that day, you know, is that protected political speech? Or because he was, you know, effectively inciting this insurrection, does that then, uh, you know, get excluded from the qualification of political speech? Again, I think these are difficult legal questions, but there's a reason why, and we'll get to the polling in a little bit, there's a reason why I think a majority of the country is like, yeah, I support it. Because if you just look at the plain face reading of this text that no person shall hold any office, if they have, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof, majority of the country I think looks at that and goes, yeah, that rings kind of true. Well, so that's why I think it's entirely appropriate for this to go to the Supreme Court. The reason Sagarwai said that mm. a lot of people it seems to me like they're not arguing the legal merits of the case. They're just arguing that this really shouldn't be a clause in the Constitution is because if you're just appealing to like, you know what, it should be the voters that decide, period, end of story. I do think that's a legitimate position to hold. It's not the one that I happen to hold, but I do think it's a legitimate position. But that means you just don't think that this should apply in any instance. Part of the reason why this hasn't been used in 100 years is because we haven't seen this particular set of facts and circumstances ever unfold before us. I just think it's, I don't think it comes even close. I mean, the reason I could say BLM is they burned down a police station. That's revolt against civil authority. But they I weren't think trying to overturn an election. But that's my thing. It'd be ludicrous to prosecute them. They should be prosecuted for property damage, not for insurrection. I mean, this is one of those where even this whole, like you said, Keystone cops trying to get electors changed and all that, that has all been dealt with at a like very basic legal matter. Rising to this, and this is the other thing about insurrection as we commonly understand it from the Civil War time period. This was legally defined by acts of Congress. Yes, by the Republican Congress. Also, I should note, much of that provision and of that time was when the Southern states no longer had any political ability to exert their will in Congress because of the radical Republicans that were in charge at that time. I'm not saying, I'm not even against that. I think it was probably a good thing. But mm -hmm. the legal understanding and the 
questions around insurrection and who was a legitimate officer and whether they violated their court and what that all meant, that all changed around 1880 and such forth as we came to a reconciliation part and we moved on past reconstruction. There's a lot of debates and things about that time at the country, but this is my point is that the bar needs to be so incredibly high, as in like the Rosenbergs literally passing along nuclear secrets to the Russians or Benedict Arnold or quite literally uh, Bob Hansen. But treason, there's again, no question. is a different question. Yeah, but I mean, so in insurrection what, and treason in, are very in, similar. In what way is January 6th not an act or instance of revolting against civil authority? I mean, it seems to me the textbook definition of that. But then, so any again, protests if you is as well. no, that's not true. But it could be applied that I, way. We have yeah. not. Have you ever seen an instance? Maybe two thousand. But have you ever seen an instance where you have people being incited by a president to go and march on the Capitol and try to overturn the legitimate election results? We have not seen that before. So to say this is just like any other protest, mm. you know. And I know this is one of the arguments, and and you see this from uh, you know some of my compatriots on the left of basically like, this is a slippery slope Mm -hmm. and it's going to be used against us. And I am sensitive to that. Um, But I do think that this is different of character and kind than anything we have seen. I mean, it was shocking to us on that day when we saw this unfolding. If you read the, you know, messages of what these people thought they were doing, they clearly thought they were doing an insurrection. They thought that they were revolutionaries. They believed that they were patriots in this moment, but they definitely had a revolutionary fervor and were trying to overturn legitimate election results. So... Are there tricky legal questions? Yes. Do I think it's difficult to say, okay, does this technically meet the definition? Does it technically meet the definition of he engaged in it or you know, was aiding and abetting it? I think that's difficult. I think the free speech questions are difficult, but I just can't see how people just dismiss it out of hand. And most of the people who I see doing that, they don't actually engage with any of yeah. the legal arguments whatsoever. So again, there is an appropriate place to adjudicate these difficult legal questions. That is the Supreme Court of the United States. And so I think it is good that this is going there now. I think it's good it's going there in an expedited fashion. I wish I had more confidence in the court, but it is what it is at this point in history. And uh, the other, the last thing I'll say on this too is, you know, some of the like, uh, the freak out, I guess, on the right over this is like, we know it's gonna be overturned. This is one challenge out of 18. It's good that he's getting his due process. This is going through the process right now. And you know what the end result is going to be. It's probably only going to ignore to his benefit in the Republican primary. And it's very, very, very like 99% likely that the Supreme Court is going to overturn it anyway. That Very true. That said, it's one of those moments of like, oh, wow, they would do it if they could. And I think that's where, I mean, think about it too. It's like when people freak out about an abortion law in Texas. They're like, oh my God, if these people get power, this is what they want to do on a national level. Yeah, but it's those actually thing. get enacted and but, have power. Yeah, on, in Texas. But they got, they got this at the Colorado Supreme Court. No, it's I mean, going to get overridden. Okay, uh, let's just put it then. Uh, right Right-wing state wants to, dec- I mean, this happens all the time. You have a Mississippi or Florida or whatever that passes some law. They know it's unconstitutional. They pass it anyway. Then Democrats are like, look what they would do if they possibly could. And then it goes to the Supreme Court and it gets struck down. These are, of course, people have a not even a right. I think they should freak out about it just from a small d democratic level. I just think, again, to come back to the bar and what it looks like. I agree with you. It should ab- absolutely should go to the Supreme Court. I'm glad yeah. it is. I'm glad it actually will get resolved early rather than have all this stuff play out now years. I would say the same for January 6th, but Trump has never been convicted of insurrection. That's another thing, is that there was, a, well, it's complicated, but back in the Civil War time, there was a military tribunal and military understanding on the terms of Appomattox and the terms of, I forget where Sherman accepted uh, the other the other surrender, but there was a commonly led understanding of the Union Army as blessed by the commander in chief of what it looked like and what the terms of parole. Now, these were all laid out at the time and such that you stayed within that. You would no longer, you know, you could be eventually rehabilitated and Congress itself could decide that you were no longer and you were able to run for election. This is all long, you know, Reconstruction era stuff. We haven't had a single one of those types of understandings with Trump, which is, again, why I don't even think it comes close to the so bar. What- What to you, in terms of like, if something, if a different set of facts had unfolded on January 6th, what to you would meet the bar? So if our Congress passed a law that said January 6th itself was considered to be an insurrection. So you think this should be in the hands of Congress? I think it should be in the hands of the commander in chief and of the Congress, who should commonly come to an understanding of which, and then should then be challenged and tested within the court where we can have a genuine understanding and have a total democratic buy-in. This act was itself an insurrection, so to as you, the it's union not, did. It's not necessarily 
necessarily that January 6th doesn't qualify. It's that you don't think that the Colorado Supreme Court is the appropriate no. venue to determine. Oh, absolutely. But you, yes. if, if the Congress had passed an act that said, yes, January 6th mm -hmm. was an insurrection, you'd say, okay. Absolutely. Absolutely, I would. Just as we did under Reconstruction, as we understood what rebellion was, as we understood what Confederates were. This is about both democracy, about law, and about the way that we, I mean, let's let's go to, go to the next one here, please, so we can put this up on the screen. This is why I do think it's complicated, and it gets to what you're talking about, which is that the Supreme Court, about being disqualified for insurrection, and they specifically point to people like Zebulon Vance in 1875, Great who was a genuinely unreconstructed Southerner and Confederate who is disqualified from holding office. And this gets to the question then of how it's interpreted in the modern era. And actually, Colorado is not the first time uh, that, this has, that this has happened to them. So let's go to the next part. You found this, where the presidential hopeful shows that a naturalized citizen who wanted to run for president, despite not being American-born, lost his bid. Why? Because he contended under the Constitution's requirement that the U.S. born provision violates equal protection rights under the 14th Amendment. This is something that Jenk has put forward previously. A magistrate judge actually ruled that it did not affect the validity of the Constitution's distinction between natural born and naturalized citizens. He eventually appealed that decision, and a panel of the 10th U.S. Sort of Appeals backed the judge who found that the state has a legitimate interest in leaving him off of the ballot if he cannot assume the office. This gets to a little bit of the interpretation yeah. of that 14th Amendment. Crystal. Let me explain why. Why this matters and is relevant to this particular case, it's because um, one of the legal questions here is whether the state courts are the appropriate venue to decide constitutional ballot issues. So even though this is a different constitutional ballot issue, in this instance, not only did the uh, did the original, the Colorado, I believe, state Supreme Court decide that, yes, it is an appropriate venue for us to decide. We have an interest directly in deciding these constitutional ballot issues. But the other thing that's interesting is when it went up to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals and they agreed with the Colorado State court, guess who was on the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals? Uh, Niels Gorsuch. Right. So that particular legal question, that's why that's relevant here. Now, yes. there are a host of other legal questions as I've been discussing. The First Amendment issues, what is an insurrection? How do you determine? Is this provision of the Constitution what they call self-executing, meaning that you can just apply it based on its, you know, sort of plain face meaning? Or does it require an act of Congress in order, as Sagar is suggesting, that's what he thinks it should be at least, mm. that it requires an act of Congress to set forth, okay, here's the definitions, here's how it um, here's how it operates, here's how we determine, et cetera. Again, all of these things are sort of open-ended because we have so, had so little precedent in terms of using this provision um, after the Civil War. So, um, you know, it's, as I said, I do think it's a complicated legal question. I don't think that it is like easy. I think these are tricky things, but you know, when you look at the just basic definition, if you look at the plain English uh, language interpretation of what this provision says, it does seem like it applies. To me, it does seem like it applies. I think, to me, January 6th, I think it's very easy to classify it as an insurrection when you consider the intent and what the people involved were in, in understanding their, uh, their business on that day, what they were up to on that day. Obviously, Trump was, the whole reason they were there was because of Trump, right? So I don't think it's crazy to look at this and go, yeah, this is appropriate. And again, I come back to, I think it is also appropriate to have a provision like this in the Constitution. I think a state has an interest in protecting, you know, the, protecting the country from people who have attempted to subvert it in the past. I think that's like a basic sort of tenet of statehood, frankly. I, I don't disagree that it should, I mean, at a certain point, whether we agree or not on the Constitution doesn't matter because it ain't going to change. So it's there. The 14th Amendment is a long time, test of time, so it is what it is. As for the intent thing, though, this is where I just disagree because, for example, if I join a cult and I kill somebody in cold blood or I killed somebody somebody because of my religious beliefs. Am mm -hmm. I going to get prosecuted for religious crime, especially if it doesn't fall within their hate crime provision? No. Even though that would be defined that would be defined as a religious act of war, whatever you could want to call it rhetorically. I would be prosecuted under the state of Virginia or DC or wherever I happen to reside and I would kill that person. They would prosecute me for murder. If it fell within a hate crime provision, then they could add on, you know, whatever. These are well commonly understood within statute of which they can be applied and adjudicated through the legal system that have now stood the test of time forever. You know, a common understanding of something, like a hate crime, for example, I mean, that stuff gets thrown around all the time. There's a reason
reason that the judge gets to actually rule as to what it is and what it's not. We could sit here on a news show and call something a hate crime. That's fine. It's within the First Amendment, but that's not how the law works. So I just think saying like how it appears, you know, based on our individual understanding, that's not how, you know, interpreting the Constitution, the law, nor should it work, both from a civil code and a criminal code. It's like well within an actual understanding through the legal system. So I guess there the one thing- There is actually quite a lot of precedent of using the dictionary definitions of terms and even looking back at what was the dictionary definition of the term during the time period when this amendment was instituted to try to determine what was the yes, meaning, plain face meaning at the time. So it's not like you have to be some secret decoder to figure things out. Different judges apply this differently. Some of them do take more of the like secret, secret decoder approach. That was, I mean, for example, it feels preposterous, the lower court ruling that the presidency is not an office of the United mm -hmm. States. You look at that and you're like, what? That's ridiculous. But, you know, if you look at this provision versus that provision and maybe at the time and they should have specified it in particular. And, you know, there are other courts who have thought that as well. And that part is sort of in dispute. So there are different ways of analyzing this. But I just want to point out that it is not unusual or, um, you know, out of the realm of what's appropriate. To just look at the dictionary definition of these terms and what the people writing, you know, this text at the time, what they would have thought that these words Mean. Yeah, well, that this you now you're opening up originalism and interpretation and living constitutions yes, and all this. There other, are many schools of thought stuff. on how to do I'm this. I'm sure the lawyers here and, are tearing their hair. And out. let's also be clear. Like yeah. I've said this many times before, all of that sort of goes out the window because of the partisan nature of the courts. Where you know I have no doubt that when it gets to the Supreme Court, they're going to find whatever legal rationale that they want to do what they want to do, and they'll sort of fill in, you know, backfill the. Um, legal justification after the fact. So it's not like I think that these people are all like just calling balls and strikes and trying to faithfully apply some sort of an approach. Not at all. But there are plenty of instances where just looking at the dictionary definition is actually how people approach these rulings. And, you know, we really are in unprecedented territory. We haven't seen something like what happened on January 6th before. We haven't seen a president like Donald Trump before. We haven't seen, you know, this set of facts and circumstances in quite a long time. So again, Difficult decisions, and I think it's appropriate to be left to the Supreme Court. It'll be fun. Uh, uh, Crystal, I'll be, I'm looking forward to hearing and seeing what happens. Hey, guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com. Become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber-funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So, again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.